Love and happiness. Something that can make you do wrong. No, I'm glad you can make you do right. Yeah. Yeah. Wait a minute, something's going wrong Someone's on the phone Three o'clock in the morning yeah. Talking about How she can make it right yeah. Yeah. Happiness is when you really feel good about somebody There's nothing wrong Being in love with someone Yeah Oh baby Love that I have to have
Ah, oh, man. I want to thank everybody who's tuning in right now. And if you could get people to share it. Um, I got a very special guest today. Uh, he goes by the name of Seth Magaziner. I actually, I like your last name. <laughs> Yeah. It, it, it's actually really good for, uh, for, for to be a politician with a last name like that. Just because nobody else has it? Just because it's like, No, it just sounds yeah. slick. It sounds smooth. Yeah. It's how Seth Magaziner. Yeah, I'm glad you think that because I never thought that growing up as a kid. You hated so your last name? I, yeah, I didn't know if I hated it, but I, you know. Did you? Did people make fun of you like like uh, that last name? Like a little bit, but not no not 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 much. I mean, like they rhymed it with yeah. certain things. But it's like you know, it's like it doesn't rhyme with anything. It doesn't or it doesn't like you. There's I no could I could think of something off the yeah. top of my head, maybe because I thought I was a bully, <laughs> but I, I I wasn't a bully, so don't think that. Um, I actually um. This this is going to be an interesting conversation because there's a lot to 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 dissect from this conversation and I think um a lot of people who if you're able to call in I want you to call in 401 400 5002 we're going to we're going to talk about a couple of things and um at, at, in doing my research I found out a lot of things about you that I I'm really impressed with and I'm hard to impress Nice I'm, ju I'm just saying I, I'm, I'm hard to uh, impress because I feel um, uh, uh, politicians do care about um, their constituents in, in some form or fashion but the black community is overlooked and there are things that you are doing that actually um, I can say would, would help the black community out and and I think it's it's dope that you were you're you're thinking like you were thinking like that before everything's everything that's going on is going on so um and doing my research but um once again I have Seth Magaziner in the building and um we're gonna we're gonna talk about who he is and we're gonna we're gonna start with that right away um so who who's Seth Magazina? <laughs> well, first of all, thank you again, uh, Ruckus, for having me. Um, so Seth Magaziner is a uh, you know born and raised Rhode Islander. I grew up here, went to school here. What school did you go to? And um, so I started out. I grew up in Bristol. Um, okay. I started out in Bristol Public Schools. I, I ended up going to Brown for college. And um, by the time I graduated from school, you know, I had grown up here. This was my home, but I wanted to try something else. So I. After college, I moved down to a, a town called Opelousas, Louisiana, uh, rural Louisiana. I got a uh, chance to go to Louisiana, and it was like one of the best times I've ever had. Where did you go? Um, I went to the uh, the French quarters, and I went to Bourbon Street, of course, because that's what you ha where you have to go. Sure. But um, I actually went for a Jay Z and Beyonce concert. That was oh, my cool. new thing. I went to at the Mercedes Benz. That's so awesome. It, it was it was actually like the people were really nice. It was it was a it was a great time. It, it's a really unique place down there. Just the culture is like unlike anywhere else in the United States. You know, the music is different. The food is different. It's just a different. Oh, and and vibe. having that yeah. experience, did you bring some of that back to Rhode Island to say, hey, we kind of need to be on? For sure. And um, well, in a lot of ways. First, I'm an LSU football fan now. I'm, uh, you know, I, I put hot sauce on everything. But <laughs> no, but the real, like the real way that it had an impact on me is that that's where I realized that I wanted to go into public service. So I went down there and I was a school teacher. Uh, I was a public school teacher. I taught third and fourth grade. Um, town that I lived in and worked in was, you know, majority African American. Okay. The, the school that I taught in. Uh, about 80% of the kids were black and, um, you know, maybe 60% of the teachers. And we were a segregated school district, like not, not in the way that we're segregated up here where it's, yes. yeah. you know, not legal segregation, but it's still segregated. Yeah. Down there, we were actually still segregated. So we had a, uh, within the district, so we had a, um, like I said, my school student body was probably 85% black. There was another elementary school three blocks away, 75% okay. white. They had a nicer building. They had two sets of textbooks, one to bring home, one you know to keep in school. My kids only had one. Our school library, the books in our school library still had the stamps in them from the other school's library. Wow. We had the hand-me-down books. Wow. Right? Did, and, and did you find that that was, the th that was like the norm? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it was infuriating. And, and you know... I taught young kids, and even from like a young age, like the kids knew, like the kids could tell, yeah. right? Like, and and I, you, you know, I, you certainly don't need me to tell you this, but like, you know, 
that's when I began to see kind of, you know, a first row seat to, you know, what it is to, to, to grow up black in this country. And I can never fully know it because I haven't lived it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, teaching in that school, you know, I had my fourth grader, Frederick Spencer, you know, asked me one day very innocently, hey, Mr. Magaziner, how come sometimes when I'm walking down the street and I pass yeah, white people, they don't look in my eye, right? I mean, why, you know, is the other school nicer than our school? What, what did you? What, did, what was the? What was the answer for that? What can you say? I mean, you know, you you try to explain. I mean, it's it's. There's no good answer, right? Yeah, I mean, no, no, the answer, there there isn't right, a good and, answer, and, but. And the answer is, you know, um, that there are people who unfortunately look at other people differently because of the color of their skin or where they grew up or the way they talk. It's yeah. not right. And yeah. We've got to do our best to try to fight against it. But, um, you know, it's, it's a harsh reality. And I think to see young kids, 8, 9, 10 years old, grapple with that, it's, it's heartbreaking. And, um, and, and it also occurred to me that a lot of these problems were solvable, right? So, for example, I mentioned the two schools. Yeah, yep. And what would happen, because we had a, a desegregation lawsuit against our school district, every once in a while, the judge would, like, move the line to try to better integrate the schools, right? Yep. And then, and it, would ha it happened a few times while I was down there, and then all of a sudden, you know, a lot of the white parents would say, well, but, but he lives with his grandmother now, or he lives with his uncle now, right? And we would call that zone jumping. Yep, yep. And... They, they do that a lot in, in Rhode Island. Sure, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so... But, you know, like, there are solutions to that, right? Like, one solution, like, like, even just down there in our district in Louisiana was, well, okay, instead of moving the line around, just get rid of the line and say this school well, is first, second, and third grade for everyone. This one is fourth, fifth, and sixth grade for everyone. Well, I, I would say, why is it fair that um, teachers get to live wherever they live and not, not actually live in the districts that they teach, but kids cannot? Uh, yeah. go to the schools that they think or parents cannot put their kids in the school they think would probably give them um, a better education. Sure, yeah. And, and, you know, I'm not saying I was the best teacher in the world. I mean, I was 23, 24 years old. This is my yeah. first job. Right? Yeah. But I was a better teacher because I lived in the community that I was teaching in, for sure. Uh, uh, do you, did you find that that helped you um, understand the students better because you lived in the, in the same yeah. community? Yeah, because, you know, you, you, I mean, you, just those informal interactions, right? You go to the supermarket, you go to the store, and you bump into your kids and their families, right? And, and you just kind of build a, a rapport that's it's less formal than like a parent-teacher conference, you know? What yeah, I mean? yeah. Um, so anyway, it was that experience that, that made me feel that I would want to go into, in, into politics one day. I mean, I, um, the other thing that happened when I was down there was, uh, you know, there was one, this, it was a small town, it was pretty rural, right? Yeah. There was one nice restaurant downtown, it closed down, and then the Home Depot closed down, and like stores started closing. And we didn't know it at the time, but it was, it was the beginning of the Great Recession. Yeah, right? yep, yep. And I just remember thinking, you know, there are decisions being made in boardrooms a thousand miles away that are impacting the lives of my students and their families. And the people in those boardrooms haven't spent time in communities like the one I was working in. And, yeah. and those of us who were in the community didn't really know much about what was going on in those boardrooms either. So, you know, I decided that I wanted to try to bend things, bend the financial system, bend the economic system to better serve communities like the one I was working in. And I went back to school, got a business degree, and ended up running for treasurer, and I've been state treasurer ever since, trying to use my office to build a fairer state. That's a great, you should be a radio personality. That's a great segue. Because oh. <laughs> I was going to get into the fact uh, of, of what, the question of what is the, uh, what's the responsibility of the state treasurer? What, it, what is your job? Yeah. For, the, for those who don't know, and, and by the way, that's what I like to do on the show. I like to bring people on that you might not know. is They're in the background doing this work, and they're up every day early going to work to try to better Rhode Island in some sort of way. And it's not just the people you see on TV. It's not just Gina. It's not just... Um, uh, Alo uh, Jorge Aloza, it's it's a lot of people involved yeah. in trying to make this thing work. Yeah. So um, the the treasurer, what is that? Yeah. So uh, at a narrow level, the state treasurer is is in charge of managing state funds, state money, everything from like 
the general fund where like when we all pay taxes yep before that money gets spent it has to sit somewhere and so we have a, a general fund that we manage we manage the state pension fund basically all of the state's assets all the state's money we um we're charged with investing and and uh, responsibly managing that's the narrow definition of the job okay more broadly uh Again, I don't think it's my job or my mission to just mine the store, so to speak. I want to use the platform and use the influence of our office to try to correct inequities, right? And so, you know, for example, one thing that we've done is we started moving the state's cash, the state's money, to local credit unions and community banks mm. to help the local economy here in Rhode Island, and particularly to help support those banks and their small business lending to try to you know, again, use our influence as the office to, to help promote economic activity in our communities here instead of the big banks out of state. So I want I want to speak on on something that um, before I have a lot of questions actually. Yeah. So I want to speak on something that has to do with the banking and whether or not that it it, it makes sense for um, the black community community to have their own banking system that would be able to give them um, loans because. What you find with, with creating a small business, especially a small black business, is when you go for a loan, for the most part, that and and it's it could be a feeling that um, the minority community feels, and it might not necessarily be a thousand percent true, but they feel like they can't go to the bank and get a loan because they're going to get turned down for one anyway. So if we had our own banking system, and, and not to be um, not to be segregated because you don't you don't want to go there, but you kind of want to be able to talk to someone that could understand and believe in what you're doing. On top of that and be able to say, hey, I'm going to take a chance on you. We're going to approve this loan. Yeah. Do you think that a, a, a banking system, a black bank system would make? Yeah, so first of all, I think what you're talking about is absolutely real. And and so there have been studies, right? I just read one again a few weeks ago. The studies where, you know, people go into banks pretending to be bank customers to take out a loan. Yep. You know, black people and white people with the same... Prof, you know, it's 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 again, it's not real, but the same profiles, the same resumes, yeah, the yeah. same everything, and oftentimes there are different results, right? Yeah. Some people are encouraged to apply for loans; others are encouraged not to, right? Yeah. They just did, again. I just read a study on this again a couple weeks ago with the um, what's called the PPP loans, which is this new program. Yep. And, yep. Know, right. And so again, like, so so bias is certainly there in the banking system, just like in so many other parts of our society. Yeah. And then on top of that, right, even if you somehow control for that, that bias that a lot of people have, um, then there's also these other structural barriers, right? Like you want to take out a loan, you need collateral. Well, collateral like means you need some, <laughs> some wealth before yeah. you go in, right? All right. But, yep. but how do you build wealth if you can't get the loan to build a business, right? And so it's this sort of catch-22. So, so what I'd say is a couple of things. Um, first, I think it'll work a lot better if when you walk into a bank, uh, the people working at the bank look more like the community that they're working for. Okay. Right? And yep. So, you know, I don't I don't know if that means a, a a black specific bank, but it certainly means banks that have more diverse staffs and staffs that actually come from the community, from the leadership level on down. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so that's something we should promote. You know, we um, again through our office we invest money in companies all ac across the country, including here in Rhode Island. And one of the things that we've done is we've said, okay, when it comes time to vote on who the board of directors is at these companies, Rhode Island is only going to vote for slates of candidates where at least 30% of the candidates are people of color. Okay. Um, which is not a high bar, by the way, but is one that very few companies meet. Yeah. So I think part of it is is we got to push the banking system just like we got to push government and the rest of our systems to be more diverse in their staffing and their leadership and then we also should have programs to help with things like the collateral issue you know um, so programs to help people get small business loans where you know maybe the state puts up some collateral for people who don't have it or um, 
you know that's a good idea of, yeah other kinds of supports that we can offer so again i i don't i don't pretend to have all the answers yeah. but i think the problem that you're talking about is 100 percent real and we as a state should be proactive in trying to make it easier um you I, i'm actually going to take one of your quotes um out of out of uh the journal that you you said we are living in an un unpredictable time rhode island does simultaneously face in a deadly ap epidemic a historic recession and a systematic racial racial equalities um that are gone undressed uh, unaddressed for too long uh what did you mean by this what 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 was behind this quote like i mean there's there's a bunch in here the, yeah. this one quote there's a bunch in here and it, with everything that's going on just by you saying something like this it tells me that you kind of understand what's going on you know first of all 2020 is i mean it's been a hell of a year well, right hasn't it hasn't it oh. yeah um but um I think what I was trying to say is that big challenges require big solutions, right? You know, this is the time for us to go big and be bold and shake things up, you know? When we're dealing with an epidemic and a recession and these very necessary but 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 tough conversations about about systemic racism like this isn't a time to sort of shrink back in our seats and be passive. Like we, we yes. need to, we need to step up. And so, you know, the the op-ed that you're referencing, uh, I was basically calling on the state to invest hundreds of millions of dollars uh, to meet these challenges: um, the healthcare response, restarting the economy, and then also uh, initiatives to correct some of these wealth inequities that we have in our society and, and lift people up. Um, this this is you know, the, 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 this is a moment that is calling on us to do big things. Um, how do you, how do you think the state is um, responding to that? How do you think that they're doing? A, yeah. Um, a, okay. I, I, I'll give you if if please, yeah. a hundred was the greatest and zero was the worst. I'll give the state um, for Corona. I'll I'll give the state they're doing a, a hell of a job. Um, for. <sighs> The, for the racial problem, uh, I I feel like at first they were it was gung ho when they when they finally when it finally hit which which makes it really makes me feel weird because it, it makes me feel as if oh wow we really have a racial problem yeah almost like almost like what um the speaker of the house he didn't uh, he didn't know that there was uh, that Rhode Island had anything to do with slavery which. I mean that that quote right there just tells me how blind some people are, right? So when when we have these issues and they're brought up and and now it's time to face them. And as you said, we should we should be going full steam ahead. It shouldn't be we, we shouldn't be tiptoeing around anything anymore. It's right in everybody's face. It's it's been seen. Let's take care of it. I feel like they. I feel like they're at a thirty percent for me. Yeah. For me, that's my personal opinion. Yeah, I. I so I, I generally I agree. I mean, I think you're right. The Corona response has been good. You know, um, as good as it can be. Anyway, yes. Yeah. Right? Yes. Given the circumstances. Yes. Um, and you know, uh, I think com when you compare us, especially to most other states around the country, and and the total lack of leadership in Washington, which is a whole other story. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Corona leadership, I think, has been strong, and I give the governor a lot of credit for that in particular. Um, you know, when it comes to addressing systemic racism, you know, the first step is is calling it out, and, and it did feel, particularly in the last month or two, like there was a, you know, a moment happening where people were willing to have tough conversations. And there were some good announcements that came, you know, along with that. I, you know, along with the governor and, and the mayor, I, you know, announced that we were going to remove the word plantations from state checks. And yes. Like that. And we're going to put it on the ballot. And that's all great. But then when it gets time to talk about the hard stuff, I do worry that, that we may be losing a little bit of momentum. So, you know, police reform, right? Um, uh, they're studying it. 
in the legislature, but I hope that a study turns into action. Well, right? well, the, uh, and and um, oh, sorry, go ahead. Are we are we past studying? We like, oh, 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 we, oh, we, I think yeah, we should be past studying. Totally. Like, <laughs> exactly. No, that's what that's exactly what I'm saying. Right? Is that like that's why I'm a little worried. Right? Yeah. I'm a little worried that we're studying when like we already know what a lot of the answers are. Yeah. Right on that. Right. And so, you know, I I think when it comes to the economic piece of it. I'm still hopeful. So one of the things that I called for in the op-ed was more money for affordable housing. Yep. The governor just this week announced that she's increasing her proposal for affordable housing this year from $25 million to $65 million. We want more, but that's still a step in the right direction. Uh, yeah. um, you know, I, I called for a, um, a jobs program where we can put people who are facing unemployment to work on COVID response and helping out in the schools and other yeah. things to help us recover. I'm hearing good things about that, that that may happen. Yeah. Um, so we'll see. I mean, I think I think the grade is still incomplete to some extent, but um, but I, I do share your concerns. I, I'm I, worried that we, this momentum needs to keep going, and, and I'm worried that... And, 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 it, and we need to see happen. some... some tangible change it needs something yeah. needs to be something needs to happen now the things that need to happen i think we've we've started addressing them but um i i think that uh we have to get to the meat of it and and getting to the meat of it is them uh, who, the powers that be who mm -hmm. uh would be the governor and and the mayors have to go into the community and understand what's missing in that in that uh, aspect of, of racial tensions or or systemic racism, they have to understand what's missing because if you are and and I hate I, I'm hoping I'm hoping when it comes to the higher hires uh, higher ups in in the government like like um the governors and the mayors yeah. and and the senators they do not have the same um, thought process of, as a speaker of the house. Yeah, you know. Um you made a good point earlier, which is, you know, I, I mean, when you when you grow up white in America, right, it's very easy to just be blind to what's going on when it comes to systemic racism. And, and even people who are well-intentioned. Is it? I'm, I'm, I, I'm just really curious. Yeah. Is it? So for, I'll give you an example, right? I'll give you an example. Um, there was a great article. You know the, the 1619 project that the New York Times has been doing? Yes, there, yes. Yeah. There was a great article a couple weeks ago where they talked about how... If you poll white people in America and you ask them, is there a gap between how much wealth the average white family has and the average black family has, they'll say yes. You ask them how much of a gap there is, they say, well, we think that on average, black households have 90% of the wealth of white households. Oh, wow. When the actual, I mean, when, when the, the actual number is less than 10%. Yes, right? yes. Yeah, we're talking wealth here, not income. But yeah. Like income gap too, but wealth. And so again, it's like, I think... You know, that's a poll, so it's sort of like the whole population, but like it shows that there's like some awareness generally that there's a problem, but I think a lot of people, even well-intended people, don't know how deep the problem is because they haven't seen it face-to-face -face and they certainly haven't lived it. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm going to ask you a tough question. Please. Um, do you have kids? No. You don't have kids? Oh, well, the, the, do, you, do you have nieces, nephews, anybody yeah. really young? All right, so I asked, I, I had this conversation and it happened to be um, all black guys at the table, but... Um, I asked them, when do you tell your kids the truth? Not, not, not what's, because I grew up in Cranston, I, I graduated from Central High School, so I got taught differently yeah. in both systems, right? And in the system where, in Cranston, I had to find out who Malcolm X was, who the Black Panthers were, who 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 was who Mega Evers was, what happened to Emmett Till? Like I had to go find that out. Yeah. And oddly enough, in the Cranston Library, it wasn't that easy. Yeah. You, you know, so me having to find that out. Whereas when I came to Providence and I went to Providence schools, it was more of let me tell you about this. So. My question really is, when, when is it comfortable for a white family to really tell the, the kids the truth? Yeah, I mean, 
again, I'm not a parent myself, but I think it's something that you got to start from a young age, like you have to, and and not talk about it in a way like, oh, this is something that's in the past, or it's just something that happens other places, right? Because we tend to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like we, you know, in Rhode Island, we tend to think that we're all enlightened and that we, yeah, you know, yeah. when, um, when not only, you know, slavery and, and systemic racism are a big part of our history, but it's still part of our present, too. And um, Thank you. And so... Yeah, I think you got to start from a young age. Um, I'm not a parent myself, but uh, but we got to do it. And because again, you know what? Like that's. I mean, and, and by the way, like talk about white privilege, right? Like that's that's a that choice is a privilege that black families don't have. Like they don't. You know, you can maybe when a kid is really young, you can wait a little while, right? But yeah. like at some point, you either have to explain to them, well, or they're gonna find out themselves well, with my kids it's it's more of the empowering situa- situation before i give them yeah the 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 dirt i don't i want to i want to make sure that they understand that they come from kings and queens and 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 africa isn't just a jungle you know it, it has it has one of the best economies and and one of the enriched uh earth period um so I, I kind of let them know that before we go into what the what America's past is shameful past to me, yeah. but America's yeah. past is. But I, I'm I'm glad I'm glad. Thank you for that answer. That was a good answer. That was that was good enough. Um, I want to get into uh, Rhode Island's economy, and and I I definitely want to get into unemployment right now. Um, we're we're teetering on. A lot of people being unemployed, and how can how can we rebuild this economy and realist realistically rebuild this economy? Yeah. So uh, this is a crisis, right? And it's about to get a lot worse today. Tomorrow is is the day that the extra six hundred dollar a week stipend runs out, yeah. right? Cause, yeah. Because Congress hasn't reauthorized that. So we had. 200,000 Rhode Islanders file unemployment claims since COVID began, which is just a staggering number because we only have 550,000 in the workforce. So, I mean, 40% almost wow. applied for unemployment at some point in the last four months. Uh, still 100,000 or so unemployed today. And, you know, some of the people who are unemployed, maybe most, will be going back to work as the economy reopens in the coming months. But I think the hard reality is that a large chunk of the people who are unemployed in Rhode Island today, their jobs are not coming back until there's a cure or even beyond that. You know, um, tell you, like go to, go to Target, go to, you know, McDonald's, go to like a lot of, especially big chains. Mm-hmm. And there are more of those automatic checkout things now than there used to be, right? There's 100%. more automation. And so 100%. A lot of these jobs, I went to Walmart the other day. I couldn't even yeah. figure it out. Oh, yeah. Well, and uh, yeah, exactly. So a lot of these jobs aren't coming back because, to be honest, I think a lot of companies had sort of been waiting to make these changes and lay people off, and this was a convenient time to do it, right? Um, so what do we do? I think we can do a few things, and we should do a few things quickly. Number one, in any recession – one of the best things to do is you put people to work building stuff and fixing stuff, right? Fixing our school buildings, fixing our roads and bridges, fixing the ports, uh, building more affordable housing. Right? Yes, yes. Like So that's why I've been pushing in that Providence Journal op-ed and, and working with the governor uh, to do this bonding, to build more affordable housing, to fix more roads and bridges, because we need those things, but also it'll put work people to work in the process and and the schools you're talking about we definitely need the schools rebuilt this is they're terrible yes totally and this hits home to me as a former teacher that taught in a terrible school building i want to come back to that in a second if we can um but look putting people to work building and fixing things is one way that we address this crisis but not everyone can work at a construction site right so that's not enough um the other idea that I put out was what I called the, the COVID core, which is we can put a lot of people to work doing response work, right? So we need contact tracers. Yeah. That's a, that's a job that can be done from home with, with a cell phone. Um, we need more people working in the labs. I've, I've gotten tested a couple times just as like I got tested after going to one of the protests and stuff like that, all negative, thank God. But, um, yeah. you know, it takes a week plus to get a result back because we need more people working in the labs processing tests. Um, If schools reopen, when they reopen, however they reopen, 
uh, teachers are going to need more teachers' assistance to help them with distance learning and help them monitor the kids. I remember the uh, Providence School Department got rid of a lot of the teachers' assistants. I think they need to bring them back. Totally. Yeah, in general, yes, and especially now, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so I think we can put a lot of people back to work um, doing COVID response type jobs. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're, you know, working in an emergency room. Again, a lot of these jobs can be done from home. Um, but that's another thing that I'd like to see. Um, you know, at the end of the day, this is a time the state needs to step up and put people back to work. And then um, the final thing I, I'd, I'd say for now on this is um, this is an also this is also a good time for people to go back to school and get retrained. Um, the state should step up and make that easier to do, make it more affordable to do, um, make it easier for people to go back to school, get new credentials, get new skills. Um, uh, in a way that won't burden them with lots of debt. Yeah. Do you think it's a good time to open up a small business in in this time in this time right now? It's, I mean, it's a hard time to open a small business, and I mean, yeah. I mean, it's um, you know, I was glad that the governor last week she she announced a small business grant program, um, and she did say that she would allocate at least twenty percent of the money to um, minority owned businesses, which was good. But um, twenty percent. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You know, I mean, <laughs> yeah. it's a start. We'll put it that way. But um, so I was glad that she rolled that out. But no, it's it's a tough time to be in uh, to to run a small business, and so um, you know, I it's hard in normal times. It's especially hard now. Um, I actually got a uh, a question from the chat, which I love. I love right. I love when people um actually ask questions from the chat. Um, they ask, why is it so difficult for minorities to register for the MBE program in Rhode Island? So, if I understand the question, and and if I don't, maybe they can they can update the, and the they, chat. a second yeah. part. So I'll, let me just oh go ahead. Um, why did Rhode Island not issue any of the thirty four million dollar government COVID contract funds yeah. to minority contractors? Yeah. So so. I think I understand the question here. So the the two questions, as I understand them, are why were there no minority-owned contractors that did the work on the field hospitals, like building those three hospitals? And then the second, uh, the first question, as I understand it, is why is it so hard for minority-owned enterprises to get state contracts in general? So first, totally unacceptable that there weren't any minority-owned contractors put to work on those projects. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't involved in that. My understanding is that they waived the requirements for that because they said it was an emergency. But still, uh, I think there are plenty of qualified contractors. I know there are plenty of qualified contractors in the construction trades yes. that could have done some of that work for sure. Um, you know, what can we do to make it easier for minority-owned enterprises to get state contracts generally? I think there's a couple of things. Um, and I've talked with a number of legislators about this. I've had some good conversations with Senator Metz about this. I'd say a couple of things. Um, one, under the current law, the state says that at least 10% of contracts for state construction work have to go to women or minority-owned enterprises. It shouldn't be women or. It should be... One or the other. One, should yeah, exactly. Because what happens a lot is... You know, you have a construction company that's owned by a white guy, right, who maybe lists his wife as a co-owner or something mm. like that, and now yeah. that counts toward that 10% threshold. So I think one thing that we should really look at is um, having a, a standalone requirement just for minority-owned contractors, not women in, right? Um, and I, I think 10% is a, a really low number. Oh, I think totally. we should definitely hike that up. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then there also needs to be some enforcement to it, right? So again, one thing that I want to know is they waived that already pretty weak requirement for the field hospitals. How often is that rule waived? And who decides that, right? And so I think that's something that we should look at so that it's harder to, um, it's harder to, to ignore those rules once they're in place. Beyond that, I mean, uh, I think this is where um, uh, collateral again comes into play, bonding. So, yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I do want to speak about bonding. I yeah. do want to speak about bonding yeah. because I, I don't, I, to be honest, I don't understand yeah. it. So that's why I want to yeah. speak about it. And to be clear, 
what I, I should have said, this is a different, what I just talked about was a different kind of bonding. So basically okay. it's collateral in this, in this use of it. So um, if you are, say you're a, um, you know, say that you run a, uh, you know, you're a construction contractor. So you, you know, you, you run a painting company or, uh, you know, an AC company, you know, or a uh, plumbing company or something like that. And you want to get a contract to fix up a state building or, or build a school or something like that. Okay. Right? There's a requirement that you buy insurance, which is called bonding. There's a requirement that you buy insurance in order to get that contract, which again, a lot of smaller contractors they can't afford it. Exactly. And so this is another area like collateral for small businesses at banks. This is another area where I think the state should have a pool of money that minority owned contractors can use in order to get that bonding, get that insurance to make it easier to get those contracts. So yeah, I know I'm getting into the weeds here. Yep, but, yep. No, um, got, no, you're, you're right on point. Keep, it's, it's you can stuff. keep going. Yeah. And, um, yeah. And so, um, no, I think that there are specific, like meaningful things that we well, can do to improve. I, th I think, uh, I think you, know. you, uh, you hit a couple of things on the head, but I think, um, intertwining those things might actually work out great for a lot of people which is um affordable housing but building the affordable housing but giving those contracts to minorities yes. to build the affordable housing so we can actually have somewhere to live and somewhere to work it, it just it, it makes t a ton of sense yeah. um and, and i kind of want to speak about uh the fact that I see a lot of abandoned abandoned buildings. So let, let's go. If we go down Broad Street, uh, let's take what they call Clown Town, um, the area of Portland Portland Street. Those they they are abandoned, and I'm sure they could be uh, rebuilt. I'm sure that that we can we can get some some minority contractors to rebuild them. What what is the what is what's the problem here? Like I. Yeah. This is right in front of everybody's eyes. If you drive down, uh, I'm starting to think that people don't drive around and see what Providence is looking like right now. I think it just hasn't been enough of a priority in our state government. Like people have not, people in power have not made affordable housing enough of a priority. We don't, we don't spend as much, nearly as much, on affordable housing in Rhode Island as our neighboring states do. Yeah. Right, as Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York. And so, you know, there's that saying, like, don't tell me what your priorities are, show me your budget, and then I'll tell you what your priorities are. Like, we haven't spent enough on this. And so, again, that's why I was pushing for a bigger affordable housing bond. That's yeah. why, um, you know, I'm glad that the governor has increased her proposal. I like to see us go even further. And it's resources. Like, at the end of the day, we need more resources. We have a call. Oh, awesome. Hello. Hello. Hi. I'm calling in because I'd like to ask the um, treasurer a question, please. Go ahead. He can hear you. Hi. How are you? Hi. How are you? Thank you very much for, um, you know, uh, speaking directly to our community. We think that it's extremely important that we hear um, from our state officials. And, uh, you know, we, we I'm really excited about, you know, your talks about affordable housing in the state of Rhode Island. Um, as a matter of fact, my husband is a developer. Um, he's a new developer. It's uh, SNS Development. And um, he specifically has worked um, as an attorney in um, developing uh, affordable housing in different states. And so um, one of the problems that we find is that um, while, you know, being a new development company, oftentimes you still, as a minority business, right, you often have to partner with, um, you know, other organizations that have experience. And so most of the contracts and a lot of the contractor work, uh, even though you have all of the qualifications, you are registered as a contractor to do work here in Rhode Island. What we find is that we can't break through the market because we don't have the experience. And so investors are not willing to, um, per se, give us these contracts and um, there's just a significant amount of barriers to entry and so what we want to know is that mm. one the MBE program there's uh, so much red tape for us to um, I, I help uh, small businesses get registered and I feel like the process definitely needs to be streamlined to make it easier for us to register that that's one 
And two, what are we going to do to ensure that these contracts do go to businesses that are registering but don't have, you know, um, a tons of experience? Because if we're still having the contract with these companies that are, you know, per se not minority businesses, we're still, you know, essentially giving our profits up to, um, you know, to uh, to these other organizations that have been, um, you know, receiving all of the contracts uh, uh, for years, systemically for years. And so how, how can we remove some of those barriers, especially with, um, you know, so that we can uh, essentially get a piece of the pie? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Th thank you for your call. Yeah, no, th thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. Yeah, and again, it's just one of those catch twenty twos, right? Where it's like you, um, you know, you're not getting the work because you quote unquote don't have the experience, but you can't get the experience without the work. You, yeah, right? exactly. And so, uh, you know, I guess what I'd say is like this is where the state needs to have a heavier hand and say to the developers or to the, um, uh, you know, to the general contractors. Uh, this is a requirement. You are required to give a certain percentage of the work or a certain amount of the work to minority-owned enterprises. And, you know, if you don't, then you won't get these state, you, you the developer, won't get the state work going forward. You know, it, it's, um, there need to be requirements, and the requirements need to have some teeth to them. And yeah. this is where I think the state needs to play a more heavy-handed role. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I, you know, I wish the, I caught the caller's name. Maybe you could reach out to my office because I am curious to hear about the red tape experience too. That was another issue that she raised, just the amount of red tape that goes into even getting MBE certified. And I have to confess, that's an area that I need to learn more about. So if you can reach out to my office, um, I'd love to learn more about the experience and maybe we could brainstorm some, uh, some solutions together. Um, I, we do have a couple of other, uh, some other questions. Uh, Affordable housing isn't a priority to whom um, the people in the, the people or the state reps. Um, whose job is it to push affordable housing? You know, that's a great question. And actually, this is this is part of the problem. So there is no cabinet director or agency director for housing the way there is. It's so like, for example, like, you know, we know who's in charge of education in Rhode Island, right? It's it's uh, Angelica Infante Green, like the commissioner, right? Like yeah, she is yeah. she is at the end of the day the buck stops with her, right, when it comes to the schools. We know who's in charge of health, it's Nicole Alexander Scott. Like we know Peter Alvidi is transportation. We have cabinet level people who are in charge of these different areas. There is no cabinet agency for housing in Rhode Island and there should be. You know, we should have a housing agency with a director who reports directly to the governor. Um, a lot of other states have this, even the federal government has it, uh, but we don't have that in Rhode Island. And I think that's part of why it always, why housing is one of those things that always gets left on the sidelines in Rhode Island is because there is no one person who's the accountable person, you know? So uh, uh, that could be where where things could start. Let's yeah. get somebody who's who's accountable and they're res they're responsible yeah. for making sure that these things get done. Like yeah, a cabinet level director who report who, who reports directly to the governor, just like we have for health and education and transportation and other areas. Uh, let's speak on um, the the rebuilding of the schools. Yeah. That that uh, you're proposing gets done. Yeah. So. Um, Again, this is something that that is very personal to me. And and I, I, not to cut you off, I'm sorry, but the only thing I I, I want to bring this up because I I do believe in um, minority contracts and making sure minorities minorities get the work that they're entitled to get, uh, especially if they're great contractors. Because I do know some great great co minority contractors that deserve these contracts but i also do know that they don't get them so they have yeah. to take this um bit by bit work and and their their companies struggle because they have to take this bit by bit work when i see these things happening so if it, just in your in your explaining if you could just let us know if that's one thing that you'd plan on doing with this school uh rebuilding of schools no absolutely i, I fully support having again requirements for you know uh, percentage of the work, a lot of the work going to minority-owned contractors. and But then we also have to make sure that there's accountability to that, too, and that, you know, the school districts that are actually running these projects follow those rules. 
because again, like we saw with the field hospitals that the that the commenter mentioned earlier, is that a lot of times you, when you have those rules, uh, they're not being followed. Yeah. And so, um, so yeah, absolutely. You know, as far as school construction generally goes, again, this is something that's important to me as a former teacher who taught in a school building where we had lead and we had asbestos and we had. You know, it was always too hot or too cold or too yeah. something. And uh, before the radio and, and the teacher, before the radio and the DJ, and I was actually a teacher's assistant at Gilbert right? Gilbert Stewart, uh, Charles Forts, and a lot of these schools, all the way to Carter Day Nursery. I I did um, some teaching assistance there, yeah. but um, that was like one of the problems: yeah. heating, yeah. air conditioning. That we didn't yeah. have in some some parts of the school. You didn't have it. Yeah, and kids can't focus teachers can barely focus when, yeah. when it's you know 100 degrees in the classroom so yeah exactly so you know then that like the condition of the building has an impact on the ability of teachers to teach and students to learn and we have school buildings that are falling apart all across the state so a couple of years ago uh, the governor put together a um a group to come up with a plan for school construction in rhode island I was able to sort of finagle my way to being one of the co-chairs of that group just because it was an issue that mattered a lot to me. Mm -hmm. And we put together a plan to make a huge investment fixing school buildings all across the state. We're going to spend a billion dollars over five years, $2 billion over 10 years. Okay. Um, it went on the ballot last time. So in 2018, it was on the ballot, uh, approved overwhelmingly by the voters, 77%, I think, approved. And so, so we're actually doing it. Like this is an area where we're actually like we can say that we are doing it. So, um, the money's been allocated. What needs to happen now is the school districts need to finalize their plans of how they're going to use the money. Okay. And some of them are already starting to do it. So Pawtucket is way out ahead on this. They are building a bunch of new elementary schools, and they're doing major renovations of both of their high schools. Cranston has um, a big proposal that they're bringing to their voters in November. Um, uh, Newport is building a new high school. Uh, uh, East Providence is building a new high school. Um, Providence is the big one, and Providence, they're still working on their plans. It's not quite clear how they're going to use this funding, but we've already allocated $300 million to Providence. Okay. Um, so... So this is something that we're actually. So I'd say we're in like the first or second inning of this, but I'm I'm optimistic that over the next several years you're going to see a lot of construction at a lot of schools. Um, to your point, we need to make sure that that some of that construction work is also going to businesses from these communities. But um, how much of it is going to the communities now th that you you've already yeah so the current, they've already started if yeah. you if you do know so the current the current law. Is that it is is that ten percent threshold? I would support making that higher. And again, we also have to make sure that we're tracking how much work is actually going. Yeah. And again, in most cases, in most of these communities, these projects either haven't begun yet or are just beginning. So we're still in the very early stages here. Okay. But um, but over the next several years, it's going to be big. There's going to be a lot of work going on at the schools the next few years, and it's overdue. It's overdue. Um. Just just a. Uh, uh Naomi is is the young lady that called earlier. Mm -hmm. um, she just has a, a second question. She said, "How can we assure accountability um, that the work is going to minority businesses? Like how how can that be how can that be regulated? Even though we don't have someone that does regulate, how can it be regulated?" Yeah. So um, there's an office in the state that she, she's Naomi's probably familiar with. Um, uh, called ODOE, the Office of Diversity, uh, uh, Equity, and, um, oh gosh, the last letter I'm forgetting, but um, oh, no, it's just ODE, the Office of Diversity and Equity. And th that would be, I think, the perfect place to have somebody whose job it was to track all of these projects and see how much of the work is going uh to minority-owned contractors. If it was in that sort of centralized state office, then that could be an office that had visibility not only into affordable housing projects, yeah. but also school construction, state buildings, roads and bridges, all of it, and actually track all of it and, and publish the results regularly. Like every year, how much work was done, how much work went to minority-owned contractors, 
and actually put that out every year so everybody could see it so we could force some accountability. Um, shift in a, just a little bit. Um, so Mayor Laws assigned an ex executive order on Wednesday, July 15th to start looking into reparations for residents of African heritage and indiv indigenous people. What are your thoughts on the importance of this order in Rhode Island? If, is there any realistic time to speak on? Yeah, so we do need to be purposeful, I think, about repairing, advancing policies that will repair damage uh, that resulted from slavery and from systemic racism that persists until today, right? Yeah. Um, there is a direct line between slavery, Jim Crow, redlining, to issues that we're seeing today, whether it's in the criminal justice system, the banking system, in our state government. <laughs> the housing system. The HUD. housing system, all the way through. And so we need to be purposeful about advancing policies that will help black Americans grow wealth, uh, grow incomes, and be able to live in a society uh, that is not bogged down by systemic racism in all of these different institutions. You know, I think, and again, there's a whole bunch of things, I mean, funding education, funding um, affordable housing, raising the minimum wage, making it easier for people to join unions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I think the word reparations is a, it's a special word because it has a very unique meaning in the do, sense do you that, think, like, Do you think uh, white America is scared of that word? Um, no. Well, some are, certainly, yes. I, yes. I should, let me say yes, I think many are. But I also think it's a word that shouldn't be used lightly either because to, to truly repair the damage that has been done from centuries and centuries of, of systemic racism. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm, oh, I, I'm listening. To, to, to truly repair that divide that has grown up over centuries and centuries is going to take just major, major reform and consistent effort for, you know, a period of time. And so, you know, what I would say is I support reparations. I support repairing the damage that has been done over these centuries that persist till today. But I also think we have to make sure that when we use that word, we use it in a way that is serious and that meets the true scale of the problem. Okay. See if someone else thinks it yeah. makes sense. You're on with the treasurer, uh, Seth Magazina. Uh, hello. Hello. Yeah, my name is Vernon. How you doing? Yeah, I... Not bad, not bad. Um, I just had a quick question. Um, just citing a New York Times article. It says that black men are making 51 cents for every dollar to their white counterparts. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, since with Johnson and Wales being in the city, has there been any like look at the economics between uh, in the hospitality industry with black men and black women in the black workforce? Has, has there been any emphasis put on that? In the hospitality industry specifically? Yes. It's a good question. I, I don't know about the hospitality industry specifically. I mean, I, you know, I think the same wage gaps and earnings gaps uh, that that article referenced are certainly present in Rhode Island as well, uh, probably in a range of different industries. I, I don't know about the hospitality industry specifically, but um, I, I certainly wouldn't be, wouldn't be surprised. I don't know if I'm answering your question, though. Um, I, I, maybe maybe uh, that's for part two of this. Yeah. Maybe that's for part two. Uh, thank you for your call. Thank you for having me. Um, I, so I, I know that you you did have a prior engagement, so you do have to um you do have to go. But I do want to ask you, what does Black Lives Matter mean to you? Well, Black Lives do matter, and. I'll take this call. We'll get back to that. You're on. Hi. Um, I'm sorry. I know I called. I disconnected a little earlier. But I wanted to ask um, our treasurer another question. Are we going to hold the uh, government agencies, such as police departments, um, accountable for diversity um, in the hiring process? 
uh, especially if they're receiving state funds. For instance, I don't believe that there's a reason why the city of Providence does not have police department does not have any uh, minorities in upper level um, positions when the community, um, re- you know, reflects a, a great deal of minorities, whether it be um, Hispanics, Cape Verdeans, um, you know, Black Americans, um, Asians. And so, um, you know, if, if we're going to hold, if we're going to expect that, um, you know, businesses, you know, also receive equity, uh, we shouldn't we start with our government agencies? Oh, Absolutely. Yeah, a- a- absolutely, and thank you again. Yeah, so um, again, I think one of the ways that we combat systemic racism, whether it's in banking or criminal justice or government, mm-hmm. is by having a government that looks more like the population that it's supposed to serve, right? And so, you know, that starts at the front line level, whether it's, you know, public safety, education, you know, front line services. Um, and then extends all the way up through the leadership, right? And making sure that our boards and our commissions that have a lot of power in Rhode Island yeah. uh, are also diverse, right? And so, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, she referenced uh, Providence. Um, this is an issue elsewhere, too. I mean, I, I you, you said you grew up in Cranston. Um, yeah. You know, as of, I think, a year ago, you know how many black firefighters there were in Cranston? Zero. Zero, probably, yeah. Zero. I yeah. bet. You know, in a department of like 200 people. Um, in a diverse, you know, Cranston being a diverse community, an increasingly diverse community. And so, um, yeah, absolutely. So your question was, what does Black Lives Matter mean to me? What it means to me is recognizing that for centuries, people in power have not valued black lives or black safety, whether it's slavery, Jim Crow, redlining, police, you know, many police practices today, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the rhetoric of an action of our president, the rhetoric and action of many other people who are in power. And we have to be purposeful about combating that systemic injustice head on. And Black Lives Matter to me is the guiding principle that we have to use in order to do that work of breaking these systems down and, and rebuilding them to be more fair and more just. Wow. Well, um, I mean, I do, I do have a lot more to to ask about, especially when it comes to um, when it comes to the housing and the housing crisis. To me, w- with uh, minorities and and whether or not um, we can make it easier for them to, um, um, to buy their first house. You know what I mean? But um, I knew you. I know you do have to go, um, and I want to do part two. Please, yeah, please. I want to definitely bring you back and 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 see what what else we can ask you or what else people can ask you. But I do thank you for your time. And um, we actually have um, an insurance company coming up because we definitely need insurance in in your. You need insurance in your household. I just got insurance for the first time, mm-hmm. for, so my kids can actually um, live it up when I. <laughs> when I die, they're gonna yeah. they're probably gonna throw a party yeah. with some of this money. But um, I, I got these guys coming up next. Yeah. Um, I want to thank Seth, Seth Magaziner again, and um, we're definitely gonna bring him on again, and we're gonna talk to him again and uh, sit down. And his uh, th- this was a this was a great conversation. I thank you. I appreciate. I really appreciate the invitation. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, guys, hold on. We'll be right back. Hey guys, don't go anywhere, god damn it. Oh man. 
we're, we're, we're gonna we're gonna definitely bring him back and uh, we're gonna talk to him again. I got some. Come in, come in, come in. You guys are invited in. I think. Grab the short chair for Shylin. She's she's a midget. Um, I I I do wanna implore you to um get insurance like. It was it was a tough thing for me, but we got it done. I got I I got like held by gunpoint actually, so. Interesting. Good to know. Um, introduce yourself. Introduce yourself. Come over. I'll I'll, t I'll take the middle. Slide slide around. I'll take the middle. Right here. One one two 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 two. Yeah, I, I usually don't do like right here, oh. homie. Sorry. I usually don't do uh, um, different uh, people. I, I do one show, and when it's done, it's done. But this is important, guys. Please share this. This is important. If you do not have insurance, if you do not have insurance outside of your job you do need to listen and um we're going to talk about insurance and like i said i just got insurance i'm not going to tell you how much so you guys could try to plot with my kids to kill me but i'm gonna let you know that i got a substantial amount of insurance so my kids can throw a p diddy style um funeral for me when it's time for me to go i definitely i need holograms I need all types of little things happening, so I got some insurance, and this is the agency I got the insurance through, and that agency's name is? Uh, Zuzik and Associates of American Income Life. So my name is Gabriella Syme. I'm one of the partners here. We have an agency here in East Providence, and this is Shailene as well. She's one of our senior managers. Say hi, Shai. Hi, guys. <laughs> Shailene Azevedo. Yeah, she just got a raise because of me, but go ahead. <laughs> She's, yeah, that's true. That's true. That's great. So, how'd your appointment go with her? How did everything go? Um, honestly, and because I was gonna file a grievance, um, <laughs> she was very persistent and demanding, and she she would not shut up at certain points in time. But I gave her a shot and said, "Let's do this." And no, nah, no, nah, she did great. Um, she she respected my time actually because I had some things to do, um, and. It was it was painless. Like, here's the thing about insurance that I feel like black people don't, don't um, understand. They think that it's gonna be a painful process, and they just don't get it done. But most black people, in my this is my opinion, not their opinion. My opinion, are procrastinators. I am also in that um, genre of procrastination. So I decided that I was gonna make it happen, and I got done with it. <laughs> yeah, no, she yeah, she kind of wouldn't. She kind of wouldn't stop sometimes you need calling. To, yeah, no, it's that push. You that. Realistically, what we see, and we work with working families, just like your regular families. A lot of our clients are making twenty to eighty grand. People can pay fifteen dollars a month. They can pay three hundred dollars a month. Yeah, the I, biggest thing is, I do want to ask you. Let's let's start at this. How much? Let's say you just want. Ten thousand dollars, and you're just—I know there's a lot of little stipulations in there, but let's say you're just the average person that doesn't smoke, doesn't drink. You just want to have a little ten thousand dollar little nook. How much would that around? How much? Because I know you can't give me exacts, but how much around would that cost? I, and I just—I want y'all to understand this, guys. Yes. Yeah, so the reason you're saying that we can't give like a definite amount is because it's dependent on age, your gender, and your health, right? Um, so that really just comes down to making sure that every single person knows that everything's customized. You have to sit down with someone to find out what it'd be for you. But basically, what we always say is keep it simple. Uh, for anyone who is currently working, you set aside an hour of wages. You set aside that for some people is $15 a week, that for some people is 50 and that really just comes down to a start. If you have to customize it from there, you want to increase it, decrease it. That's why it's good to sit down and establish a relationship with a, with a representative. So you could pay as low as like twenty dollars a month, yep. basically, and have a life a, a good enough life insurance policy for your kids to at least 
uh, put your ass in the ground and yes. not in a wood, not in a wooden box and not in uh, a cardboard box. Yeah. yeah, and that's the thing is to know that that just can't happen. It's expensive. It doesn't matter what you do. It's always going to cost you something yeah. to take care of someone's final expenses. So it's basically there's a cost at some point. It's either upfront month to month. Yep. Or it's when it happens. And you guys know that happens with everything. Yeah. You might not want to pay the insurance up front with your phone. Then you walk out of the store. And, and your phone happens. breaks. Yeah. Damn. I really that, need to get that. That's that, what we need to understand. That's that shit right there. That is, yeah, that's that's right. what happens here. And that's what I was going to say. You know, look, she's persistent. That's a great agent because it really comes down to people typically buy this. Yeah, but her pitch, her pitch was... What if you leave here and someone murders you? Like uh, that was Listen, that was that was rough for me. That was rough. Your friend pulled up. Air, he did not say that. <laughs> but what just happened? Your friend can, pulled uh, up. Can, can you repin? <laughs> oh yes. I need you to repin. Listen, your friend just pulled up outside and said, "Is and I just saved here? your life." And she said, "What do you want?" Right away, just so you know. Oh wow. <laughs> if you had some beef or not? If you yeah, we can wow. And so she I, said, she I said, like, "I don't know what he's here." I'm not gonna say I don't know who that guy is. I'm so glad you got the life insurance. I think this is a great <laughs> friend. <laughs> yeah, but th that could have been someone who owed me money too. All right, I wasn't he's here. Nah, no, I appreciate <laughs> it. I appreciate it. Him, but he's here, so if he owes you money, you can figure that out. So all right. She's helping you, man. Yeah, she's helping you. I, I put that. That's like that's like all state when you call up. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. I get, I get it, and they pop up. That's that's, that's nice. Right. That's what you need. So. For insurance agent. So what 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 type of um, person? Because there are people that do not get accepted in to get to be accepted for insurance. So what type of person does not get accepted just in case they're on and listening? <laughs> That's why it's so important to sit down and check because it depends. It can be because of your health. It can be because of multiple health issues. It can be certain medications that you take. It can be. You've gotten five DUIs, and yeah. they're concerned you're going to get into an accident or it's a continuous issue. It can be just a, a multitude of situations. That, that's why it depends on each person. Now, the thing is, it's easier to qualify. Like, it is, it is easy to qualify, but this is why it's important to really take care of this. Like, I always tell yeah. everybody, take care of this before. Like, 40 is the oldest. You should... You should really take care of it. Not that you, you're it, gonna need it after that, but right. you're gonna wish you took care of it. Early. If you have insurance in the chat right now, um, people are listening. If you have insurance in the chat, just ch put a put a uh, a wave emoji. I want to see who has insurance, and not insurance with your work, which we're gonna talk about. Yep. Not insurance with with your job. I'm talking about independent insurance outside of your job. Yes, and that's good. Is, is she, can I? Have whatever. <laughs> It's good to have whatever you have, but you need to know what it is you actually have. That's the problem. Most people just don't know what they have. Uh, they, they don't know and they don't understand it. Um, I'll, I'll be 100%. I mean, I'm glad I, I talked to Shy because I actually got to understand it more. And 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 they actually came um, another day and they let me, um, they gave me a little rundown, which helped me understand it more. But, um Get, see, explain the difference between insurance at work and independent insurance. So let's see, because this is so important, right? A lot of times we explain this to people, and they they just want to feel secure in what they've already done. Right? Yeah. So like, did you already have insurance to work? So I, I did have insurance to work, and I actually, when Shy asked me, did I have insurance? I was like, yeah, hell yeah, girl, I got insurance. You already know I got insurance. But I really... <laughs> <laughs> come to find out, come to find out, I thought that because I left the job and went to another job, and I thought that it traveled with me, and it does not. So when you got hired, did you sit down and read every single page? Of course I did. Signing? Of course I did. Okay, so that's what happens, right? So then we ask people, okay, so do you have insurance? They're like, oh, yeah, I definitely do. And the, the, the biggest thing we hear, too, is like, yeah, they match like, uh, you know, two times my salary. That just means two years of income. Right? Oh, okay. So, like, let's say you pass away, even if it does pay out, right? That's two years. That's all there is, you know? So that's good that they provided that for you. If it was a bit inexpensive, that's great. Uh, but that's group coverage, right? That's what it comes down to. That's while you're on the job, while you're working. So group coverage as in they, they're, they're insuring the whole company and yeah. not just you? So the company has an agreement for that coverage for everyone who either falls through their qualifications or just is employed by them. That's also when you got to think, like let's say they just give it to everybody. 
well, that means there's probably a, a lesser chance that that's actually going to pay out because mm -hmm. they know it's a bigger pool of people. It might be accidental coverage. It's always term coverage. Like they, yeah. they wouldn't provide you permanent coverage because why would it make sense for them to pay for something once you leave that company, right? Like why would they pay your funeral for every employee that ever died? Them, yeah, right? exactly. So at some point, that's what happens. So if you get laid off, right? Right now, tons of people are seeing this, right? You get laid off. Uh, you become disabled. Let's say you you know you had a bad diagnosis. You're ill for you know six seven months now. You're on permanent disability. Well, your benefits are changing every time there's a change in like your work status, right? Then if you even retire, um, those might go away. They might all go away. What happens as well is you speak to someone else in the company, and they're like, yeah yeah yeah, you get options when you retire. Yeah. Have you ever gotten like crappy options? You know like options you don't like. So like the option might be it's gonna cancel. You have to pay more. The face amount's going to decrease. It's only going to cover you for 10 more years. Yeah. And a lot of people take it. A lot of people are like, it's going to cover me for 10 more years. It's going to triple in premium. I went from paying like $40 a month to now, you know, $140, $200. Like, that's what happens. It'll increase in premium. And then it's going to expire at some point anyway. Yeah. So that's yeah, yeah. temporary insurance. That's work insurance. That's great to have, but it's typically not going to pay out. And that's the thing. It's actually interesting, but I was doing a little bit of research and just seeing that, like, 60% of people have insurance, right? So it's a, it's a good majority of people. But it really just comes down to what type of insurance do they have. Mm -hmm. That's typically that temporary insurance. So it's good to have both, right? So that temporary insurance, and if you get term and temporary insurance outside of work, that's for, like, if you die. If you die when you're paying your house, if you die when you're sending your kids to school, if you die early, you know, okay. pre-retirement. Okay. Know? okay. Um, the whole life is just permanent. It's just forever. So it's just there. For most people, especially middle to lower income, that's typically the money they have behind to, to, to pay the funeral, right? Um, and if not, it's just extra money, you know, that's left behind to the family if you do have something to take care of everything. But the biggest reason that we work with the, the groups that we do, a lot of the unions, associations, credit unions. Which, which is a, a lot of prominent people, by the way. Don't, don't get it twisted. These ladies work with some people. See, that was the other thing, that question that I got. I got, well, who do they insure? Like, I don't want to. They, 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 they're not just Joe Schmo off the street. How long have you been doing this? I've been there for seven years. Seven years, and then you're with a company that's been doing it for? 70. 70 years. So... Uh, th this is these are seasoned. Well, she is seasoned. She's a rookie. So, but but she for yeah for a rookie she's good. But seasoned over here. So four zero one four hundred five zero zero two. If you want to speak to him, you have a question about insurance. Listen, this is not the time to be bashful, people, because we don't know when the shit's about to happen. At any moment, the shit can happen. So. You need to have some insurance to insure your kids, your grandkids, and make sure that they're um, they're straight. And this is what um, the other people do to create generational wealth. Those other people do to create generational wealth. It's just true shit. Minorities don't do it. Black people don't do it. Um, and and uh, just just to let you know my story, uh, my mom passed away, and she had work insurance. She did. And it covered a couple of things. That's about it. My dad, no insurance. They had to fly him back from San Francisco to Rhode Island, which cost. The only good thing about him, he was a veteran. He 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 fought in the Vietnam War and a couple other wars. So um, he was. It was good enough that he had that, and they they buried him for free. But um, we got we no, nothing. You know what I'm saying? So after the burial course and everything else, there was nothing left. And nobody got anything, which does not happen with the other people. And when I say the other people, the opposite of my color. The, the other side of the spectrum. White people. So that's what I want you all to understand. I, and I, want, I, I do want you to call in with any question you have because the, the ladies were here. They're ready to answer. They're ready to answer. You see this water? This is smart water. They're ready to answer any question you have. 401 400 5002. Oh, this is your water? Of course it isn't hers. Huh. Uh, she ain't drinking smart. She's drinking. What is that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, what, what they want to know the insurance company info. So let's, let's start with that and then we could talk about some more. 
I want to I want to go into some scenarios of people that you insured and then some people that you couldn't insure and you don't have to say their names because we don't want to embarrass them but I kind of do want to know them because I want to laugh at them but besides that so start with the the company info okay so uh, like we were mentioning as far as working with the unions um, to tell you a little bit of background on our agency Okay. Yes, yes. Uh, our agency is here in East Providence, so think of it almost like franchises, right? Like Subway. You can buy a Subway, right? So you can become an agency. Chris Oils, do you have insurance, Chris Oils, for your daughter? I'm imploring you right now to get insurance, you goddamn you. <laughs> Go ahead. That's a good front, see? See, now you're doing what Shailen was doing. I've been doing that all week, though, haven't I? Yes, that, that is true. That's good. That's good. I'm um, uh, because because I, I know for a fact there are people out there in my, in my family that don't have insurance, so I want to make sure they do because I don't want them to be in the situation where they have to figure out how to bury somebody, and especially me because I'm expensive. I have champagne taste. I want to be buried standing up with DJ equipment. I, that's how I, I want you to walk in to the club because I'm not going to be buried in a funeral home. I'm going to be buried in the club. I haven't decided which one yet. I, I want people to come in and I want the records to be turning and me actually DJing sunglasses. I'll take sunglasses just in case. Um, and and I'm expensive. I'm expensive. I'm an expensive hoe. Do you have all this written down in the will? Well, that's the next thing. Yes, okay. That's the next thing. Let me go step by step. Okay. okay, so let's get to company info, okay? Let me actually go company first because obviously because of the company. All right, so he said he needs it, but go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. So obviously because of this company, we have this opportunity, but um, the company was founded in 1951. Uh, the gentleman who founded the company, Bernard Rappaport, uh, you can really look into just his legacy as well. We actually just had a competition week this last week to protect as many families as we could in his honor. Um, but he really wanted to work with working families. His family was an immigrant family. He wanted to work with working families. Um, so he started really working with the unions, associations, credit unions. So our PR team really establishes relationships with these unions. And you know, you may have been in a union, you know, you can um, give us a little bit of feedback if you've ever been in a union on there as well. Uh, basically, they look for benefits for you, right? So the Teamsters, the IBWs, the Layunas, all, you know, construction workers. Uh, we've done firefighters, nurses, teachers. We've done, like, Rhode Island hospital workers. You know, just average people. Everybody you see working, especially a lot of the essential workers right now. Uh, unionized, especially here at Mass, Rhode Island, Connecticut, is uh, a large majority of our business right now. That really just comes down to your everyday people who have temporary benefits. Okay. So now, that's really the demographic that the company... That was our niche. So we haven't, you guys have never gotten mail from us. We don't have commercials. We don't have a mascot, right? We don't have any of that. We just have well. relationships. We have Shailen. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we have great representatives that represent the company, you know, uh, because that's what we do. We do one-on-ones and really help people really understand their benefits and take care of their benefits. So that is where most of our clientele is really stemmed from, is from that working family and really just average working income uh, that most people have, that's who we work with. Now, as the companies continue to grow, mm -hmm. those union members the opportunity to also refer friends and family, and we've continued to grow. Now we have several different opportunities for families to sit down with us who aren't in a union and to receive those same exact benefits. Um, so this is benefits for your legacy plans, right? Funeral protection, income protection. So if you're making $4,000 a month, you can leave that every single month to your family for, you know, typically people do five plus years of their income. Okay. Um, taking care of your mortgage, you know. You have to ask yourself, you know, it's a very, definitely a very important question that a lot of people don't think about, but like if you die, do you have a life insurance policy to pay off the $200,000 on your mortgage or would your spouse be left making those payments on their own? What happens if six months later they foreclose? What happens if, you know, like there's, there's so many bad situations that happen every single day. Oh, we have a call. Okay, let's see what they're talking about. Hello, do you have life insurance? Hello. Do I? I do. Yes, I do. Okay. How can I help you? My, my question is, my sister died 
and she had some sort of insurance, but it was out in California. When I went out there, it, they didn't pay. I had to pay the people right up front. I didn't. The insurance company didn't pay me until months, months later. So what good is it to have the insurance if they're not going to pay out right away? That is that is a good question. I bet you guys do. So, All right. Th thank you thank for you. calling. Sorry. They're going to answer it right now. <laughs> Go ahead. You can explain the freedom of Okay, freedom. so remember what I told you about that demographic we work with, right? That demographic it doesn't have 10, 15 grand laying around to have ready for the funeral like that week, right? So even if you do, right? Let's say in our community, so I'm Hispanic. My dad's Dominican. My mom's from Honduras. Um, what do we usually do? Hispanic community, black community. So someone passes away. If we can't come up with the money, how do we usually come up with that money? Um, you rob a bank or you do GoFundMe. Yeah, you're selling pasteles, you're selling food. You're, you know what I mean? Like you're, you're doing car washes. You're doing, like we see a lot of that. Yep. Um, and it really just comes down to people don't have the money for like the upfront payment of the funeral. Yeah. So our company specifically, since we work with a demographic that we know needs that upfront money, we have a freedom of choice certificate. So do you remember that from Shai going over it with you? Um, Pop quiz. I do not, but you can refresh my memory. You could, you could re uh, listen, I was yeah. talking fast. I was really trying to get out of here, but I was trying to make it happen. So go ahead. Okay. So the reason we even and we don't don't ever try to quiz me. <laughs> go ahead though. We try. Jesus, my show. This goes to show how much you're paying attention. Right. Um, we actually check in on our clients every six months, every year, because of this, uh, because people forget. But this is so important. It's a certificate that then allows you to designate how much you want to spend on the funeral, and that does a couple things for you. It allows an immediate payout for the funeral money. Okay. okay. So then you're not worrying about is the money going to come in before the funeral. You sign over the freedom of choice. Okay, I'm, listen, yeah. I'm listening. To, no, you go ahead. You're, to, the you're talking to them, not me. Go ahead. <laughs> and uh, that allows your family to really be able to have that payout immediately. So let's say you took out a $50,000 policy. Yes. Right? Yeah. How much is a funeral right now? Um, it could be $50,000, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. But what, like between fifteen? Yeah. Around there, fifteen thousand. Yeah, and and again, a lot of people are like, oh, cremation. It's about half the cost, but it, it actually just really, really stacks up without people really realizing it. Like every little decision during a funeral is very expensive. The stones, the memorial cards. Uh, it's it's pretty crazy. You know, if you've had firsthand experience, you know how crazy of a time it is emotionally. Yeah. To be that. Yeah. Dealing with the craziness of the finances on top of it, trying to figure out with people how to coordinate the money and who's got what and there's deadlines like we need this money by Friday. You know, they passed away on Tuesday. We need this money by Friday because if not, we just can't have the services. You got people yeah. trying to fly in. You know, it's, it's pretty crazy. It's a hectic time. So this allows you to say, okay, I have a $50,000 policy. You can't go to a funeral director. There, I've honestly, you know, my brother passed away four years ago. We dealt with a funeral home. Very professional. Very, like, really, really nice to the family. Really awesome, you know. So there's a lot of very prof professional people. But you go in there with $50,000. What are they going to show you for a funeral plan? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? They're going to show you nicer caskets. Yeah, of They're course. They're going to show you the nicer room. They're going to show you, you know, oh, do you want limousines to drive to and from? How many limousines? How many? You know, there's a lot of options. You go into a room just like this, and there's a ton of caskets, you know? Maybe someone likes gold. Maybe someone, there's just so many things. Yeah. That, think about it. What do we like to do when someone passes away? You want to show out. You yeah, you want to you wanna respect their wishes. You exactly, want to. Exactly. And some people, look at you. He's over here saying he's bougie. You got to throw a, a lavish funeral. Well, you already you know. know. It's, it's me. Go ahead. <laughs> That's what happens, though. You know, you want to, and, and even if you have a modest, modest funeral, I'll be honest, I feel like we had a very modest funeral. It was just respectful. My, my parents are Catholic, so there's certain things you want to do, and, and you know, and uh, it, was, it was expensive. It was expensive. It was like $18,000, you know? And the thing is, too. I'm offsetting the cost by charging people to get in to see me, but go ahead, though. <laughs> see, that's smart. That's what you have to do, because it really just comes down to, when you don't have that money up front, you know, having a certificate like that freedom of choice, what that just does is now you're not going to walk in there and say, I have $50,000. You have to go in there and know this conversation should be happening 
prior. It yeah. doesn't have to be talked about all the time. Let's sit down, make a plan, put it on paper, legalize it, get a will, you know, keep it simple. And now you have your insurance, you have a will, people know what's going on, just the people that are important to you that are your beneficiaries. Now when it happens, they're better prepared during such an emotional time. So now they go in with the certificate. And say, how, many, how many beneficiaries can you have? You can have, you typically want to just have your primary and then your contingent. Anything as far as designation, that's like getting into your will, that's getting into your estate. That person that you designate has to, you have to legally tell them how you want them to handle things. Yeah. But also that person has to be someone you trust so that they do what is intended, you know? Okay. So that's kind of once they get the money, they decide that, you know? So Let's talk about whole life and um, term. Yeah. Let's talk about the difference between the two because I didn't understand that and... Mm -hmm. You guys hit me. So with whole life, that's what I'm Stop. talking about. With uh, can can she answer this? Yeah, I would uh, love for her too. Yeah, uh, what's the difference between whole uh, right here? This I is mean, the so this life. is called a mic. And, and tell them about life. the freedom of choice with the whole life with with how that works. Nice yeah. and loud. So the freedom of choice certificate that Gabby was talking about comes with our whole life policies. So whole life is for your whole life. So it's going to cover you for your whole life. So a term policy, it terminates. Stop. I, it it kind of sounds like common sense, but sometimes people just don't understand that a whole life policy is going to be locked in, so the rate is never never goes up. So okay. If you get locked in at a 42 year old rate, when you're 60. What if I didn't want people to know? Go ahead, though. <laughs> go ahead. 62, Jesus. When you're Christ. 62 years old, you're still paying a 42 year old rate versus term. If you get a term policy with one water. of our products. One of our products is um, a 10-year term renewable and convertible plan. So if you were to get a 10-year renewable and convertible plan, you, it would be active until you're 52 years old. At the age of 52, you then decide if you want to convert to whole life or if you want to renew another 10-year term. Now, uh, uh, you, you have... Explain to me a little bit that you can also borrow money from yes, so your your life insurance policy. What which one can you borrow from? The term or the whole life, or is it both? Or how does that work? How how can I borrow some money? I'm broke. So the whole life policies they do accrue cash value. You do have to have the policy for a certain amount of years in order for the. So the whole life is the one that. So the whole life is where it's at, especially if you're young. It's cheap. You know, you're getting locked in at a cheap rate. Especially for kids. Like, I've locked in my son since he was eight years old with a $50,000 whole life policy. And when he is in his adult years and he has a family of his own, he already is locked in with a $50,000 policy. I do want to talk about oldism. Are you familiar with that term? <laughs> no, what do you mean? Are you familiar with that term, oldism? I feel like you guys, um, you, you insurance agents, uh, are bias against old people because she just mentioned young 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 Isn't it ageism? oldism ageism i'll take either word but you, i i don't feel that you should be uh judging somebody who doesn't have an insurance policy and they may be 60 i'm so glad you say this because listen we would i've been i've been judged everybody. i've been judged but you're not old you just said, yeah. oh, oh, that's not what I heard, but go ahead. Okay, so we don't make the standards. Okay. Right? These right. are like federally regulated standards. You have to qualify. Let me ask you something. If you were going to give someone... <laughs> if you were going to give someone $200,000, would you ask some questions? Of course. If you were going to give someone $200, would you ask them some questions? Of course. You would want to know some stuff about them. We have to know. We have to know if you're going to pass away. But I, I feel like I would get if I was if I was going to get that two hundred or two thousand back. Mm -hmm. I feel like I would get it back from an older person than a younger person. It's the thing is. I'm just saying. You the ask is, the question. We would love to insure them. We would love to insure everybody. We don't set that standard. So a lot of people will get upset with like an agent, and the agent's like, "Look, I just qualify people." The company just looks at mortality tables. It's how long are you? So my live? my how great grandfather back? is 102. Can we insure him? No, you cannot insure yourself. Oh. Past 80. He probably has some insurance. Are you past 80? Are you serious? Mm -hmm. Why? Because they're they're so basically. Right? He still runs a 5K. I'm sure. That's awesome. Congratulations. Does he have insurance? Ask him because he probably. Wow. Has. wow. That's I don't why have, we actually. I really do not. Like I don't like that answer. To tell them that some people don't know that, and then they want to get insurance when they're 85 because they're worried now, and it's it's it really is about getting it 
when you do qualify, you know? So there was one question, the, the caller that, that called in as well, talking about the payout right away. Yep. I think that's a big issue people really get concerned about. Like people are like, oh, I, you know, it didn't, it didn't pay out, whatever the case may be. That's what's important to know. Life insurance through work, or mostly your life insurance, it's going to take 30 days to six months to pay out. Like, that happens. People get tied up. They haven't sent in the paperwork. I was just speaking to someone who didn't even look into making a claim for, like, three months after. We've had agents who go and knock on someone's door to check because we, we've had their lead. We haven't been able to get in touch with them. And, you know, they knock on the door, and they're like, oh, that person passed away. And we're like, didn't they make a claim on their insurance? And they're like, no, we had no idea about the insurance. And now we help them make a call. And now in a couple of days, they have $50,000, you know, mm. that's, that's important. You got to know how it all works. I bet you a ton of people have insurance money that they haven't claimed. There's is it, is, is, um, is insurance policy, is it tax deductible? You're, you're not going to be taxed on the insurance that's left out to you. Like it's not considered your taxable income. Okay. So that's, it, it's so important to then like, look with the whole life and the term life, it really just comes down to like. Can you have both? Yes, you should have. Yeah. That's a big misconception. People. Think All right, here we go. Here we go. Yeah. Misconceptions. Because so, people are like, oh, let me cancel this, and then, and it's like, no, you want to accumulate. You you can have as many insurance policies as you would like. Yes, yes. it's it's diversifying your portfolio. It's getting more financial assets. Like you want to have things for different so, scenarios. So uh, would you would you situations. would that be a turn on for women if I'm like, yo, girl, I got like five six insurance policies. It would just show that. You would it tur sure. Would you be turned on? I would think that you. You shouldn't date handled your insurance. adulting stuff. Like, I mean, I would 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 insurance. you be turned on? Yes or no? I would be like, okay, he's a responsible individual. Oh, so you that that makes you feel all right. That's cool. No, that listen that yeah, this could so be it's cool to get like that. But you know, you know something, uh, and I'm I'm making that's light of it, and I'm making fun of it right now. But honestly, that's what might have to happen. It might just have so, to be. Cool. We might have to get Fifty Cent and and. Yeah, uh, Nicki Minaj would talk about yo got life insurance. Yeah, because you I gotta think, that think would about be awesome. it. I, all those people, of listen, course, people with money have life insurance. Money. Like that's the biggest thing. You're insuring yourself. If that's not your biggest asset, then what is? You know. So you have to look at it as you have insurance on everything. Why don't you have insurance on the income maker? Exactly. You know. So yeah. even with the whole life, just to answer that. About Danielle, do you have insurance? Okay. I'm just going to be calling no, random people perfect. out. I'm telling you, that's great. You have to look at it. We always tell people, people buy insurance typically when someone passes away, when they've gotten bad medical news, or when your insurance agent finds you in the mall and says, we got to sit down, right? No. That's, that's <laughs> what happens. So it really is important to just take the opportunity to make sure you take advantage and take care of it when it's not a hectic situation. It's not because you just realized you got to pay 10 grand for your mom's funeral or for your, your cousin's so, funeral. Or, you know, all in all, you do you do have to basically, everybody's going to die. But mm -hmm. um, should you take out insurance policies on the rest of your family? Let, let's, I know you could do it for your kids, but I'm talking about like for your aunts and specifically. Have, well, you have to have an insurable interest. Insurable interest. Yes. Yes, and they should all have insurance for themselves. DJ Flip just walked in the door, and I was an advocate on making sure he got insurance, and this is his insurance agent, and this is the company that insured DJ Flip, too. So Spanish people, no, you can't get insurance. Talk yes. about the uh, for insurance. process, how easy it was. How was the process? It was super easy, right? I don't. It, it was so easy, I don't remember. <laughs> Um, no, but it, it, it was it, honestly, I'm being real with y'all. It was not hard. Um, you, it, you can, it, if you think that it's going to hurt your pockets, it's not going to hurt your pockets. If you, you can get what you can afford, basically, right. you can get what you, what you can afford. And I'm sure you spent $20 on them Jordans. So what the hell? Yeah, that's month. Remember when I was saying like an hour of wages? You just well, uh, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta bring it to the people. We gotta bring it down to the people. One less Jordan a month. Exactly. One less Jordan a month. Stop bullshitting. <laughs> cigarettes. You know, if you're smoking cigarettes, a pack of cigarettes a, a, a week. You know, you can set anything aside, and it makes it really simple. And that's actually, I was looking into it because I know the other day you asked me that as well. Like with minorities, what does it look like? And I was looking at numbers, and it's pretty crazy, but 
pre-retirement rates of death are higher, of course. In is it is it legal for you guys to look at race? As a factor, that's because some people think that because I'm black, I'm not insurable. No, so that that has a lot of layers. Okay. Whoa, 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 whoa. Here we go. It really does, though, because people will say it's just like health disparities, and with what what are we talking about when we're talking about percentages? Because people will say, oh, black people are more likely to not get accepted because of their health. Let's say. Well, that's a lot of layers again. It's not that black people are more are less likely to be qualified. They're more likely to have health issues because of the lack of health care resources. Like, you know what I mean? There's so many layers to that that it doesn't start off with like, oh, they're going to get rated or declined because they have more health issues. I don't like, this sounds a little racist. No. Yeah, <laughs> it sounds a little racist. I'm just being real with no, you. No, but think about it. Think about it. Even with Hispanics, right? People will say Hispanics are more likely to have diabetes. No. We're more likely to have less access to health care, to have crappier access to food. To oh, have, I like this you know question. What I'm so it really just comes down to communities that really have that they think that they're less likely to get insurance. It's typically because they really don't know what it takes to qualify. A lot of them can qualify, but realistically, their rate of qualification isn't any more or less than anyone else because of race. Like, we don't look at race when we qualify you. It really just comes down to we may have, like I tell Hispanic families all the time, I see a ton of clients and a lot of, just like in my family, a ton of us have high blood pressure and diabetes. You need to get insurance and you need to get insurance on your kids, right? Yeah. I'm a big health fan of like natural health and I see it all the time. People will say diabetes runs in my family. I hear that a lot in my community. It's not necessarily true like aside from our eating habits. Someone actually stress, said poverty levels, you know. Um they do have insurance but they wouldn't have they wouldn't have prioritized it if they didn't have kids. Yes. So that's what I was going to say as well. And look, you would say that this sounds racist, right? Why do we have less I love talking about race. I'm very comfortable talking about race because it's just facts. Like let's be honest, Hispanics, blacks and I've always talked about this. It's it's in my community as well. Like I've in my seven years here, I've really worked a lot to try to get a lot of Hispanic families to understand the importance of this because we care about our families. We need to have something in place. So why is the structure, like why would we think that, let's say, white people have more insurance than minorities? Well, a lot of people are going to get insurance for specific reasons. If they buy a home, if they have children, the light bulb goes off that you're like, man, what if something happens to me? I have to have something left behind. So you're saying we don't, we don't got nothing, so that's why we don't get insurance. So the family structures are different in our communities. Mm. That's something that, we, look, this is what I'm saying, layers. Let's say we worked on family structure, mental health, all of this stuff, and now our communities have access, right, to being able to, to really have the similar structures that white families have, well, then they would have a more of a need for insurance as well, you know? So a lot of people that are single won't get insurance. They still need to, someone's going to pay for their funeral, you know? Yeah. So everybody needs it, but wouldn't you be more inclined if you have children or a home? Stacy, do you have insurance? Um, life insurance? Uh, Danielle says, so for now, uh, so for low-income families who, who are struggling to pay their electric bill, what help is out there to help them prioritize this or even afford it? That's a great question. That is a great question. I would love to find, look, like, why is car insurance mandated? But our health insurance, our life insurance isn't. We would love to have access for everybody because to us, that really just makes sure everybody has a plan. But there's not. There's not access. Like, a lot of people will think even, like, Social Security. That pays out, like, $225 to you. Right. Oh, she's hitting them on the head today, girl. Uh, <laughs> black black people in survival mode. We plan to survive the night or even the month. We can't afford to think so far ahead. We literally, li we literally can't afford to die. Hmm. Yes, I always say that. Unfortunately, yeah. yes, it, and that's how deep this really goes. This is why I'm talking about layers. I always say that the people who can't afford life insurance are the ones, unfortunately, who can't afford not to have it. Right. You know what I mean? If I don't have money and my mom dies, how am I going to come up with 10 grand? It's just impossible. And that's just on the spot. What happens if we were splitting rent? What happens if we were, we were saving together? What happened if we owned a house together? The problems persist now, sometimes generationally. And this can create either generational wealth or generational poverty. So then here's the thing. Some people, I've seen, I'll be honest with you, I've walked into some houses that 
they are spending like their last $20 on their life insurance and they prioritize that over everything because they're concerned that if they pass away, their family's not gonna have anything in place. So unfortunately, do I believe that life insurance can be a privilege? Absolutely, you have to prioritize it, you have to qualify. Do you have right? to be a citizen? Yes, you do. And see, that's big, especially in the- Wow, look at me with the questions. That's a good one. See, but these are things that a lot of people don't know. We honestly will try to find you the best plan we can for your budget. And I've, look, we have, so because we're unionized, if they go on, if they get laid off, if they go on strike, we have waivers for that. If someone becomes disabled, we have waivers for that, where we would wait. Did you guys take care of people during COVID that couldn't afford anything? Yes, so right away when that happens, when we got on company calls, do you, like, do you mind if I hear so. from Shai with this with that question? Yeah. <laughs> I, I know, I'm not. I'm not only only because I want her to answer some yes, stuff. Yes, for yeah, sure. This is this is this is this is my quiz to her after she done ran me down. Go, go. <laughs> answer that question Absolutely. on the so. DJ Ruckus Life Insurance Show. <laughs> Can Good you question. please repeat the question? The question. I don't know what was the question. <laughs> If the company helped, took care. Oh, did did, did, did they help during COVID? COVID? Yes. So anybody that was in a financial struggle, um, which was everybody, but go ahead. Not necessarily. For the um, most part. But anybody that was the majority unable to pay for their policy, the company waived. The company waived their premium because of everything that was going on. So, but but outside of that, this is something that they own and control. So say um, they were in a financial burden and they couldn't afford the $60 that they paid a month. It's something that could be reduced to something that could be affordable for them at that time. And then we could always increase later on to like, you know, when they're back to work and yeah. after COVID and not being laid off. So that way they never lose the coverage, their family's still protected, they never have to cancel or lapse. So yes, we do work one-on-one -on -one with everybody. Now, I have a question that might be um, a little silly, but if there is some sort of natural disaster, let's say um, during, like, and, and it didn't happen here, but like Katrina happened, right? Mm -hmm. Do you guys, d d does insurance go up? Like, like. After something happened to you, you're saying? Or? No, I'm saying like, l let's say I'm, I'm thinking that the world's going to end because of Katrina or whatever, and I call the insurance company to get insurance. Would it go up? It only goes up by age. So that's that's the only thing that yeah, like affects it's not it. Like they like spike changes over time, like quickly, like that. That doesn't change. No, because they know that people are gonna die, so yeah. they'll be like, like right yo, now, you know what? Nah. Our prices up. Yeah, they can't like price gauge like that. They can't uh, do that. Pr yeah. So price gouging, so price yes. price gouging in emergency situations isn't a thing. Okay. Because no, it's federally and state regulated as well. Okay, so that's so that was a better question than I thought it was gonna be. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so I, I really, really want who's ever watching this and who's going to watch it later. I want you to send it to somebody that, you know, that doesn't have insurance or was thinking about it or teetering on the edge of maybe getting it to, to give them this show as a gift from you to say, you need to get life insurance. And anybody who's my friend, I'm officially getting rid of every Facebook friend that doesn't have life insurance. So if you do not have life insurance, I have 5,000 friends. If you do not have life insurance, because that's a Facebook cap. If you do not have life insurance, delete yourself before I delete you. We're not going to go through that because that's telling me you don't care about your family. This is this is the guilt trip I got from Shy too, by the way. That's telling me you don't care about your family or your kids, which is in in the bigger picture, it is true. Why is that true, Shy? I mean, you want to leave a legacy to your children and to your family. You don't want to leave debt behind. So. Hmm. Is it is I don't it? I see any more GoFundMe pages, basically. I want everybody to be educated on how important this is and how to and protect their And if it has to happen, like, you know what I mean? Like, there's people who are going to come through hard times. Right. But if more of us who are capable, right, of doing so are prepared. Are you going to cry right now? I'm good. Oh, your eyes are glassy. All right. All right. No, I thought you was really passionate about this. No, I really am, though, because it's very true. Uh, I'll tell you, just going into houses for seven years, yep. like, 
I do get frustrated seeing like in our communities like just sometimes a lack of preparation, a lack of knowledge. And that's why I say access. This is why I keep saying about the layers. Like, we just need to learn about it. We need to talk about it. Like, the first night we came here, you guys were like, see, I like being able to talk about it freely like this. Let's get into some different topics. Let's get into some pros and cons. Like, that's all good stuff. No company's perfect. A lot of companies have different products that are good for you. So, like, sit down and let's learn. Let's just take half an hour to talk oh, about it. So yeah. you're good. You know? If you do have an insurance company, you you could always, am, am I correct in saying this, that you could always see if another insurance company has something different or something better. Can you can you price can you price check uh, like uh, it has to be apples to apples and most benefits aren't we have certain things they have certain things yep. if it's apples to apples compare price but if it's not ask an agent what's different about this policy than this policy why should I have this and we really say diversifying like how much do you company. charge if I already have an insurance policy and I just want you to look over it and say hey this is this seems good but maybe you could this advice yeah just no, for, how much you how much you charge for advice you know people time is money. Exactly. We, that is the thing. I'll be honest. The way I've always looked at the position. And she's trying to drive a Bentley, so you guys are trying to make this money. So that's the thing. To be honest with us, we, the way we look at it is we don't, like, whoever's going to enroll is going to enroll. Let us just sit down and speak to you, and then if you're going to enroll, you're going to enroll. We don't charge to speak to you. Right. We just know that if we educate enough people, whoever needs insurance is going to insure themselves. Or whoever can't qualify, that's just, that's all it is. We're not trying to sell Is it people, true you know? that you guys actually... In speaking to somebody, you you could potentially lose money because you offer something that a lot of companies probably don't. Is that true? Like a two thousand dollar. Oh. Um, how about into the mic? Right. How about into the mic? Into the people? How about into the? In the Sorry, I keep forgetting this is here. To be honest. Oh, with you. I bet. Um, how about oh, one of our no cost benefits? Yes. What is a no cost benefit? So because we work with all the union, um, <laughs> because we work with over 32,000 unions, we are able to give back some no-cost benefits to the community. We are able to give back child safe kits, will kits, and a small life insurance policy, $2,000 accidental death and dismemberment benefit mm -hmm. at no cost. Oh, a, a dismember, that sounds... So just by saying... It, wait, what does dismember mean? Hold on. So I'll give you an example. My brother, like maybe six months ago, seven months ago now, he's a laborer. He works up in Boston and up in uh, Connecticut all the time. Uh, he had like a thousand pounds of steel, a piece of machinery, fall on his hand and like almost dismembered two of his fingers. Mm. So they have this policy in place. Now we pay $3,000 to that person, right? Depending on what your group was, they say, okay, we want you, if someone dies of an accident or if they have an accident that they dismember their hand or this and that, you'd pay out this amount. So for a lot of these unions, it's 3,000, 4,000, up to like 14,000 of accidental coverage so that in a situation like that it pays out to them wow well i mean 401 400 5002 if you want to know anything else um these ladies are very uh busy and i i'm not going to take up too much more of their time they have insurance policies to get to families now so if you want to call up and ask something right now oh you, you might have learned everything and you just need their information we're going to um put the we're going to pin their information right now um producer alex can you pin their information in in the chat and um you could go back on this uh broadcast on vimeo.com and watch it again and see what seth magazina had to say but also see what these ladies had to say about insurance and you getting a policy and i'm gonna let them give you the information right now and you could call them up and i promise i won't be in your insurance policy um interview <laughs> unless you want me to because you trust me okay and I could be a beneficiary. Go ahead, though. You can give the information. Uh, so it's Shylin Azevedo. How do you spell that? C H I. No, oh, I thought it was with an S. Go ahead, though. L Y N N. Last name is A C E V E D O. And my direct contact number is 401 359 4692. And you, yourself? Uh, Gabriella Syme. And my direct line is 774-526-3596. So our agency, again, is Zuzik & Associates. You can check us out on Facebook. You can go to our website. Um, same thing with American Income. You can look at our relationships with the union and everything on our main pages. Um, these ladies have uh, explained to me 
insurance and explain to me uh, what it what it should mean and why you need it. And I actually have gotten a policy through them, so I'm not only a client. No, but um, <laughs> you should definitely check them out because I mean we've all gotten it through them too. So it's not it's not a. Uh, uh, some craziness that you might think with an insurance policy that I mean insurance a uh, person that comes knocking on your door and trying to uh, get you to sign up for some some bullshit that isn't really there this is the real deal so um, if you can contact these ladies and try to get your insurance right man your kids uh, your kids need it I'm trying to tell you for kids as well which is really smart so okay remember what I was telling you about the illnesses and everything as well if you get plans on your children early then if they have the same hereditary illnesses, they would still qualify for insurance later. So it's really less of the, you know, what happens if something happens to my child right now. It's more of preparing them. And, and the, the, younger, the younger you are, the better it is that you get insurance. Um, I mean, that's been uh, beaten into my head by Shailen. So it, all you young people, call her up because she doesn't like it if you're old. Um, anyway, thank you for tuning in, and I want to thank everybody who, who tuned in for the whole show from the beginning to the end. Let's talk. Uh, next, let's talk. We will be on with um, a young lady that's buying up all of Pawtucket. She's basically buying the block, and you need to know how she did it and what she could do to help you because she's also looking for people to um, come in if you're an artist, come into these buildings and, and occupy them. So she's a black female that is buying the block. She's She owns it. It's not something she's renting. She owns buildings in Pawtucket and downtown Pawtucket and she's trying to make it uh, something for our community. So... That's the next Let's Talk. I appreciate y'all tuning in, and I will see y'all. Anything else y'all got to say? No? Anything else? That's it? No, aside from that, um, you know, we right now, especially with everything going on, uh, we are offering job opportunity. We're oh, continuing look to, at uh, that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we're continuing to grow here in Rhode Island. Uh, we So from a year and a half, we went from five managers and I think so from five people to start off the agency to now 10 managers, over 30 people in the first year. And we just are going to continue to grow. So we're looking for leaders. We're looking for people who really want to just help families. Um, and so don't say we don't throw it. jobs at y'all, man. Yeah, that's important. You know, they can just hear about it. You can contact us. We can set you up for an interview. Yep. I actually have a link on my uh, Facebook. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so come, come get a job and get some life insurance and if you qualify for both. And we're out of here. Have a good night. Be safe. And uh, I'll see you on the next one. You did great, Shailen.